Hey guys, Chauncey Phillips here. Welcome to my May 31st DVD update. I talk about all the DVDs and Blu-rays I've gotten over the last two weeks or so. Like I always say, if you guys enjoy my DVD Blu-ray updates, definitely give this video a thumbs up. Leave me comments below on what you thought about the titles I checked out. Always love to hear what you guys think. Also let me know any titles coming up which you would like me to check out or any titles I might have missed. Uh, the first one I have from Scream Factory, Shout Fa you know, Shout Factory, Scream Factory line. And this is a movie that I have been a fan of this movie since I saw this in the seventh grade when the day before the, the math teacher threw a piece of chalk and it hit me in the eye and there was all kinds of problems you know at the school and switching classes because of what he did and the day off school that I didn't go on that Friday I saw this movie and have been a fan of this movie ever since and it's ravenous and this is like I said this is a movie that I have absolutely loved and I'm really glad that it's out on Blu-ray because the old DVD was one of those ones that was like the widescreen that wasn't formatted for widescreen so when you watched in the TV it was still the 4x3 with the big bars so it's really great to actually now finally have this in you know no, you know HD widescreen but the movie's about um, it's Guy Pierce and it was during the Spanish American War he ended up like it was the captain of his you know soldiers and he ended up Everyone ends up getting di you know dying in this war, and he ends up living because he fakes his own death and basically plays dead on the ground. He ends up getting you know piled up with all the other dead bodies and ends up you know escaping that way and when he comes back he 's kind of thought of as the hero, but he 's kind of a wreck after this, and he can 't look at meat because he remembers like the blood dripping down into his mouth from all the pile of bodies, and he 's kind of all on edge and that captain ends up sending him away to this Fort Spencer, I believe it's Fort Spencer, out in the middle of nowhere in the mountains, pretty much where they would send all the screw-ups, the kind of people that they don't really know what to do with these people, the ones that are kind of like alcoholics and, on, you know, using drugs and all kinds of problems like that and really just don't know what they're doing. And they send him out there. He's out there, you know, I think he's been there a couple days, and um, Robert Carlyle's character ends up coming at night, you know, in the middle of the night and stumbling around and, you know, passes out. They end up, you know, reviving him the next morning and he tells this story about, you know, how his wagon train broke down and how they ended up, you know, stuck in this cat in this cave with no food and, you know, they kind of found the moss and were eating their own belts and by the end of it everything ran out and they had to start eating, you know, each other, you know, the one as they died. And well, one who was like the head of the group was going crazy and started killing people, and he ended up escaping, came to this fort, and he needs their help. So it's about all of them going back to where he said this happened and him coming along to try and hopefully rescue this one woman who was left, you know, when he left. And basically what happens is it's there's a lot of things going on. I always love this movie. It's, it's a dark comedy kind of vibe to the whole movie and has this really cool music. The the guy who, from, who was in the band Gorillaz did in the music with another composer and I think this is the only movie they ever did together but it was really cool kind of old time like weird instruments they're using. This is just one of these movies that I have really loved this movie. It has all the features, you know, the commentaries, deleted scenes from the old DVD. Has a brand new interview though with Jeffrey Jones. It's a really good interview on here. But this is one that I would highly recommend, especially if you like, you know, weird, kind of quirky uh, movies like this. This is just one, like I said, I cannot recommend this enough. The next one from Universal is Nonstop with Liam Neeson. And this is the movie when he plays the air marshal. He's up in, you know, 40,000 feet up, and, and it's like him and his partner with him. And he and Liam Neeson's character ends up getting this text on his phone that says, um, you know, if you don't get me this money and do what I say, every hour, I think it's every hour, every 15 minutes, that someone on the plane is going to get killed. And it's kind of like this mystery on who, on him trying to figure out who is doing this, why are they doing this, and who, where are they? Because these people just kind of end up appearing dead. No one hears any gunshots, no one sees anything. It's just like, automatically people start, you know, dying off. And it's him there trying to talk to the captain about what's going on. And, you know, when he's doing that, they're saying, like, they're kind of thinking that he's doing it because they aren't seeing anything. They can't find any of these bodies that he's, that he's coming across or all this kind of stuff. And the air marshals are, like, you know, thinking that Liam Neeson, you know, back in, you know, 
you know, down, you know, at the ground level are saying that, you know, he's involved and thinking that he's involved. And it's kind of one of those thriller kind of movies, you know, when it's all in one place. And I like those kind of claustrophobic vibe movies. And Liam Neeson, he's done a lot of these kind of movies where he's like the guy who's, you know, solving something or saying, I'm going to get you. And I, he's, you know, before, you know, I, before Taken, he was doing more like dramatic, but I like this kind of movies that he does. There's a new one coming out with him that has like the Black Hole Sun song, like the new version of it. it looks pretty cool. I, I like Liam Neeson. I, I thought this was a cool movie. Julianne Moore is the passenger with him that he's talking to, and it's one of those movies when you're kind of wondering like, about everybody. Is this person doing this? And I like that. I like these kind of movies when you're kind of trying to put the pieces together and figure out who's who and doing it. But it has a bunch of features on here. Um, you know, some featurettes on here, um, some behind the scenes with the, you know, the cast. This is one that I thought was just a really fun thriller movie. Uh, the next one is based on a true story, and it's Mark Wahlberg and Lone Survivor. And this is one that, you know, I would say I really like this. When it comes to war movies, sometimes I like them and sometimes they're just not really for me. This one I really liked. I really liked the cast of this movie. A lot of character actors are in this. Ben Foster, who was in, you know, um, Six Feet Under and tons of different movies, um, you know, is in this movie. Um, Mia Hirsch is in this movie. It's about a group of these soldiers, these four soldiers that are going on a kind of a stakeout mission to spy, to try and kill this Afghan, um, you know, terrorist. And when they're there, they end up coming across this kid, you know, and his father, you know, these two, this, well, basically it's a kid and two kids. And, you know, Mark Wahlberg does not want to kill him, and but they're worried, you know, letting him go. They're going to go down to the village that they're trying to hide from, you know, to do the sniper attack. But, you know, of course, letting them go ends up turning into a terrible decision. And it's kind of about them kind of as like sitting ducks in this terrible spot where on the mountain where anywhere, there's really nowhere to hide. And these this, these terrorists down there have all these guns everywhere and they're all over the place. And it's, I will give you a warning, though, this is a very, very, very violent movie compared to, you know, some war movies are like, this is a real R-rated, almost past R-rated with the level of gore and... And, like, it will shock some people, but, you know, it's kind of showing, you know, like, what it's like and what these soldiers went through. And, and it's very sad, too. It really is very sad what's happening to them. Like, I really, you know, cried a bit to this movie. The one kid who is in this movie, too, who is in that movie Bad Words, um, he's one of the kids in this. But I really like this. It has a bunch of features on here, um, you know, some featurettes on the movie. Um, like I said, though, this was, a, to me, a really well-done war movie. And the next one I have to give a quick mention to, uh, I talked about this in the shopping video, the new film that I'm in, Ghost Quake, is now finally out on DVD. Uh, you can get it on Amazon, get it on all the major you know, websites where you can buy movies. If you guys end up coming across any stores, let me know, but it's also for rent and Redbox machines. And if you guys go on Redbox, the website, definitely give it a review, You know, give it a rating and things like that. And the next one from Anchor Bay is 13 Sins. And this is from the producer of, you know, uh, The Purge and uh, Lords of Salem. He does tons and tons of movies. Sinister. And um, I really like the kind of movies he does. He does these lower budget movies that have a really cool subject matter to them. This is a remake of... Uh, um, I don't know what the, exactly the name of the remake was. I think it's an Asian film, but I don't know too much about it, but I remember seeing the cover to it. Uh, it's, you know, 13 Sins, and the star of this is the guy who played Scooby in, um, in you know, the Todd Saunders movie Storytelling. And the movie's basically about this guy who ends up getting this call, and he's kind of in the middle of getting married, and he doesn't have much money, and he's kind of worried about how he's going to go on with his life and pay for things. Gets this call from this guy going, Hello! You're a part of this game show where you can do this. And, and it's kind of him, like, telling him things over the phone, like, you know, you kill a fly and you eat it, I'll give you a thousand dollars. And it's basically 13 rounds of this game that he has to do, you know, if he agrees to do. And once he starts, if he stops, he won't get any of the money. So all the money that he, you know, ends up making, you know, after the first round, he will end up losing if he ends up, you know, stopping. And, and the, the rounds of this get worse and worse. It's like, do these terrible things. And I don't, I don't want to ruin about too much of what he does in it. But this was a really, really cool different movie about, like I said, about what people will do for money and how terribly far it can get. Like the one thing about his wedding rehearsal, what he has to do there, is terrible. It's it's a very cool, weird movie. Like I said too, I thought it was pretty cool seeing um, the kid from, you know, he's older now, 
now, but from storytelling. Also stars um, Ron Perlman in the movie as the cop, kind of investigating all the crimes that are happening around the city because of him. Uh, the next one from Image, and this is one that I'm really interested in seeing, um, at an Adam Agon, I think that's how you say his name, who directed one of my favorite movies of all time, uh, Felicia's Journey, which is, you know, uh, the star of the late Bob Hoskins, which if you guys are a fan of Bob Hoskins and have not seen that movie, that is an absolute must-see. Uh, this is called Devil, Devil's Knot, which is the story of the Paradise Lost case, which, you know, there was three document no three part documentary and then another documentary. I think there's gonna be another one as well. Um and if you guys know the story and you guys have seen the documentaries, you're kind of gonna know this whole thing already. You're kinda of gonna know what happens. Um the thing with this with this movie was, you know, it was reenactments and kind of telling the story about from Reese Witherspoon's perspective as a parent and what happened to her kid. And it's basically about these three kids that are going out into the woods with their bikes and end up dying, you know, getting killed out there. And it's kind of the mystery, you know, like I said, it's a true story about who did it, and they, they end up putting the blame on these three boys that are kind of like, you know, metalhead, kind of goth, Satanist kind of acting kids, which was really big, too, at that time, 1993. That was kind of the thing then. And they kind of put the blame on them, and they're kind of blaming these kids just because of the way they are. And there's all this mismanaged aspects of the case. The thing with this is, though, there's some cool stuff in it, but watching it, you know, reenactments and the scenes redone, the, the thing is, the documentaries are so well done. And that's the only thing about it. And even Damon Eccles, who was one of the, the, the kids in this, that was, that was, you know, put in jail for these murders, he apparently doesn't have, you know, gut behind this one. Um, but if you guys know the story... You guys know that it's, you know, what happens to them and all the, just, to me, I could go on about this for 30 minutes, you know, about my opinion on who really did it and all that. But it's a, you know, a movie uh, focusing mainly on Reese Witherspoon and her husband's character in the movie about their, the things they're going through and then the court and stuff. It's, it's okay. You know, like I said, I like certain scenes in it. But watching certain things it just made me remember how, why don't I just, why don't I just watch the documentaries? Uh, it just didn't add too much and kind of jumped around a lot. And I would rather have seen more of the later case, to tell you the truth. Um, the next one from Called Epics. And this is one that I had never seen before. And I was watching this and had a seriously cool, fun time watching this movie. And, it's, and I will warn you, it's more of an art film than I thought it was. And that I liked. And um, Under the Skin, I have the Scarlett Johansson movie, the scenes with, in the water in that kind of were like the scenes in this, which is kind of crazy if the director actually saw this. But it's, you know, Deathbed, the bed that eats. It's about this bed, and it's kind of about bed in this basement of this old mansion and people who kind of are lured to this place get in the bed and basically sucked into the bed into this acid stuff and dissolved and eaten and there's these amazing scenes of them dropping like apples in them that are dissolving in like acid and putting bubbles and things like put their arms in there that turns into bones and it's just this crazy crazy movie and um it's basically about the group of these four, uh, three girls that end up going to this house and um, when they're there, you know, one of them goes missing and, you know, dies in the bed. And them kind of wondering where she is and kind of the actions of what ends up happening to them. And there's, it's a real quirky, weird movie, too, because the, there's like a guy living behind the painting of the bed who painted the painting of the bed, who died in the bed, kind of telling the story of, you know, all the people who died in the bed in the past and all the weird things that happened in the bed. <laughs> it's it's a, such a quirky, weird movie. I really love this. Uh, it has um, the commentary on here, a new commentary, and, um, you know, a featurette showing the locations, which are really sad that the way the one place looks, it's totally just, like, totally gone, demolished. Um, but I would really recommend this. Like I said, it's from Cold Epics, and it's just a really fun one, and it's all in Blu-ray. actually looks pretty good. You know, it was shot in 16mm, and I love the music in it, too. The next one from Magnolia is Alan Partridge, which is a character that Steve Coogan has done for years, and I have never seen the show before. I don't think there's been a movie before, but I know he did a show that was back in, the, I believe, the 90s, and then he's kind of done it sporadically. But he's a, Steve Coogan's character is this radio personality who's pretty famous and kind of like the top guy at the radio station. And one of the other character people that he works with who has like the earlier time slot show that he does, 
you know, they're bringing in new people. It's kind of like Airheads, you know, when Airheads, when the station was like changing and everything, but the one guy ends up getting fired. And it's basically him coming back the night when they're kind of celebrating the brand new station. He comes back in there with a gun and kind of holds everybody hostages because he really wants to get his job back. And Alan Bartsch's character, Steve Coogan's character, ends up escaping, and they send him back in to try and keep the situation together and keep him from killing anybody and try and figure out exactly what he wants and what his demands are. There's some really ridiculous stuff in this. Like I said, I think if I, sh if I saw the shows in the past, I would know some more of the side characters and some of who certain people were. But it's one of those ones, though, I don't think you have got to have seen the, it before to really get it. Because I, I like it. Like I said, it has that Airheads vibe with the people outside trying to, you know, with the demands and things like that. And Steve Coogan, there's a really ridiculous thing when he leaves, loses his pants in the movie trying to escape out the window. I don't know. I just had a fun time with this. It has the making of on here and behind the scenes. Just a fun movie. And I always like Steve Coogan and from Hamlet uh, 2 and a bunch of different stuff. The next one is from um, Magnolia as well, and it's Journey to the West, and it's this movie for the people who directed Kung Fu Hustle. So if you know their movies, it's a real kind of quirky, over-the-top kind of Kung Fu action film, and they kind of take things and, to crazy levels and have crazy reactions. I guess you can kind of compare it a little bit to Kung Pao, even though Kung Pao is more like putting people into old footage, you know, putting Steve Odekirk's character into old footage. The subject of that, I always wish there was the sequel of that. And I remember he was trying to make that and filming it. Never happened. But, uh, in, you know, Into the West is about this demon hunter. And it's kind of set in an area that looks a little bit like Waterworld. It's like this village in the middle of the ocean kind of area by these rocks. There's all kinds of water creatures and things like that in this water. And this, the creatures are really pretty cool. They're all digital and things like that, but really well done. This guy who's like a demon hunter, but he's a real kind of, doesn't really know what he's doing. He's trying to fight this... Uh, like fish monster thing. Then he ends up meeting this woman who really is and has these actual powers to stop these demons. It's kind of them working together, fighting demons. It's just a fun, kind of crazy, quirky, over-the-top kung fu movie. Has um, featurettes on here about the stunts and special effects. Um, I don't know. I, I just thought this was a fun movie. Uh, the next one from Accelerator Entertainment is The Machine. And this one they say is kind of like one of the reviews was saying The Machine is perhaps the closest to Blade Runner than any film has come since 1981. And I guess you could say it's kind of like that. I, I think it's more like Blade Runner in the sense of the music. The thing is, though, they kind of were doing like really cool like Blade Runner synth music in the beginning, and then later on in the movie they stopped doing it. Like they didn't do it as much. And I kind of wish they would have kind of done it longer in the movie. But it's about this kind of corporation that's kind of trying to develop, you know, like super, kind of like robot human, robots that are like, just like humans. And they're kind of doing, you know, just to the kind of to the point where they're really perfecting it. And it's, it's these two scientists, it's the guy and this woman, and the woman who just came in for only a couple days to kind of scan her brain to be like the, the basis of this um, robot that they're working on she ends up getting killed and they end up you know basically bringing her back in a way as a robot it's kind of about the the guy who you know the scientist who sort of has a thing for her and him trying to you know she's when she comes back she's very like not sure about anything and it's kind of like that movie splice it was kind of about like her there and them trying to do these experiments on her and it was just really cool. It, it does have some cool science fiction aspects to it, which I did like a lot. Like I said, it does have that kind of Blade Runner kind of kind of vibe to it and these kind of futuristic vibes to it. I did like it. I thought there were some really pretty cool sequences in the movie. I like the main actress. I think she was in, I don't remember, one of those dance movies, like Battle of the Year. And a couple other things, but I did like this one a lot. Like I said, it too it had some cool music, not throughout the whole thing though, but in certain aspects and pretty cool robot sort of things. And they also have these kind of things where they turn people who have like can't hear or can't see, they kind of put like this robot brain in them so they can kind of see still. So that's a pretty cool one. And it has a you know making of on here, you know, talking about the making of the movie. Uh, the next one from Millennium 
um, is parts per billion. And this one I was really interested in seeing this because it had uh, Joss, Joss Hartnett in it. And I haven't seen him in a movie in a long time. He's kind of back now, finally, in that Penny Dreadful show, which I really need to watch. This is a movie that's kind of like set during the end of the world. And there's this kind of like pathogen kind of thing in the air, which pretty much kills everybody immediately. And it's pretty much about the people trying to survive in this. And it's, you know, this old couple who are trying to find oxygen tanks to survive. And it's kind of about like these different couples and how this is taking a toll in their relationship, you know, dealing with all that's going on. Um, it does have a lot of kind of like sort of stock footage in it. I, but it was, since it's more of an indie movie, I think that's why it did that, like some of that. But it, w it had some cool aspects to it, but I didn't absolutely love this one. You know, Rosario Dawson is in it, Frank Lang Langella is in it. Um, but it's like I said, it's about these couples and trying to survive this end of the world. Uh, it also has Teresa Palmer, you know, who is in, um, you know, uh, Warm Bodies, and she's been in a bunch of stuff I really liked. It's an interesting end of the world kind of take movie. Uh, the next one is one that I really love. It's definitely one of the top recommended ones. And it's from um, Kino's Redemption Line. And it's Pete Walker, who's one of my favorite people that they've been releasing his movies. And it's his movie, Home Before Midnight. It's about this guy who's um, in this like, kind of a up-and-coming, kind of famous British rock band there. And he ends up um, seeing these two girls that are hitchhikers. And the one girl is kind of sleeping around with all the people she gets in the rides with. Goes, she goes off and the friend gets kind of left there. So he ends up picking the girl up, taking her where she wants. And she's, he's talking to her and she's saying how she's in art school. And, um, and they end up starting going out together. And it's kind of about him finding out that she never alerted this to him at all, that she's only 14 years old. It kind of becomes this, when he finds out, it's like a nightmare. And like what ends up happening to him when the parents find out and what ends up happening to his career. And But it just really has great music too. And I love these 70s movies. It was like 1979. I really love the music and the just the whole vibe of the music. It's like, home before midnight. One of, the, one of those real 70s songs. I, I love those real 70s songs and I, I this is I just really highly highly recommend this one especially if you like Pete Walker who's done a ton of really cool uh, genre films I would love if he came back and did something again and the next one from him as well is um, House of Mortal Sin which is a woman who ends up going to a um, church trying to find her friend who recently has become a priest and she goes there looking for him and she ends up going into the confessional booth seeing if she could find him. She ends up talking to the priest who's this real strange priest who's asking all these kind of bad questions of her and he pretty much becomes obsessed with her by you know and, and obsessed with her problems and she's killing he's going and killing people off and stalking her and it's pretty much about an excessive priest um which i really i like this one a lot as well not as much as home before midnight uh one of his other movies was, was a great one was frightmare the one actress from frightmare was in this as well but pete walker movies like you really can't go wrong with his movies the next one from Twilight Times, um, from Screen Archive's website, you know, it's the limited edition. They make 3,000 copies of these, and it's Rollerball. And this is one, I actually think I saw the remake before I ever saw this one. And it's about this, you know, futuristic game where, like, in this time period where they, they don't explain everything in this movie. Though this is one of those movies where it ha doesn't have a ton of music, doesn't have a whole lot of narrative, like, exactly explaining totally this future. But it's about this guy who's on this team, this rollerball, which is this ultraviolet kind of, like, game with this ball. And they're trying to hit each other to get the ball into the goal. And, you know, the head of the game end up wanting him to quit and leave this and, you know, retire from the game. And he doesn't want to do it. And it's kind of about the reper repercussions of what's happening to him and around him and the people that he loves because he's not quitting this game. And um, like I said, though, this is from Screen Archives. They did a really, really good job cleaning this one up. I would definitely check this out. Um, I try and keep up with their stuff because they always are putting out these limited 3,000 editions. This is a really cool one. Most people, though, know Rollerball. Uh, the next one from Anchor Bay. This is one that I didn't know a whole lot about. And it's called In the Blood. And it's this woman who's going on a you know honeymoon with her um, husband. And, you know, when they end up going out there, um, when they, you know, going up their vacation, they end up, you know, going on this kind of zipline thing. They're going, this is all set, and I believe it's in, um, 
uh, Puerto Rico, I believe it was Puerto Rico they went to, and they go on this like these gigantic zip line. There's amazing scenes in like the kind of jungle area when they're going across the zip lines, and it was actually from the director of Turistas. So if you and I, I, I didn't know that till after I watched this, and you can really see his kind of vibe. It, like you can tell right away that he did Turistas. That's one of those movies that people had mixed opinions with. I really like Turistas a lot, but they're out there. And the, her boyfriend, you know, her new husband, I mean, ends up falling off of the zip line. And then, the, you know, ambulance comes, takes him away. They won't let her get in the, in the back of the ambulance with him for one reason or another. And she's like, okay, I'll meet you at the hospital. She ends up going there, gets to the hospital, and the, the husband isn't there. They know nothing about him. They don't know where he is. Uh, she goes around the next, the whole day, looking at all the hospitals, trying to find him. It's kind of about, like, the whole family coming and kind of, like, blaming her and thinking that she might have done something to him because, you know, he comes from a whole lot of money. And it's, that's pretty much what it is. And it's her trying to find him and figure out what happened to him. And Louis Guzman plays the, um, you know, the cop in the movie who's trying to help her and, and, you know, when they go back to, like, the zip line, the people are acting like she was never there. So it's one of those kind of, like, cover-up things and trying to put the pieces together where he was. I really like this one. It had really, really great settings to it, to where it was shot. It was just it was one of those ones that really held my interest. Danny Trejo is also in it for a little bit as well. But I checked this one out. Uh, the next one from Cinedyne is Motel Life. And it's Emil Hurst and Stephen Durf and um, Dakota Fanning. And it's... This is one of those kind of sort of sad kind of vibe movies, and it's about you know Stephen these two brothers who their mother died when they were very young, and um, you know the one that they basically the mother said she really wants them to stay together and kind of protect each other and you know when she dies because she knew she was dying of cancer and didn't didn't want them to be alone. And they've kind of been living in, you know, hotels and kind of motels and just sort of trying to survive. Um, and, uh, you know, Stephen Durf's character ends up getting into a hit-and-run accident and killing somebody. And it's kind of about when that happens, they, you know, it kind of shakes everything up for them. And they kind of want to get away. The police are starting to come around. And uh, Miller Hurst's character is trying to figure out ways to get money to get a car to get them out of here. Then it also has kind of flashbacks to his relationship with Dakota Fanning. And, you know, kind of like the problems that they had. And uh, Chris Christopherson is in the movie as well. I like this movie. It's one of those ones that was kind of like something else, and I can't exactly remember what else it was like, but I, I liked it one. It wasn't absolutely perfect movie, but, you know, I'm a fan of all the actors in this movie, so I thought it was definitely worth checking out. Uh, the next one, this was a really fun, kind of a movie that was sort of trying to be like a Napoleon Dynamite kind of vibe movie, and it's um, The Secret Life of Dorks. It's about this guy who's like obsessed with this one girl who's like kind of the real popular girl and he's the real nerdy guy and you know she's getting so tired of it so she ends up trying to set him up and get him on a date with this other girl who is sort of the kind of dorky girl as well who they kind of like all of a sudden had her fix herself up like you kind of thought you know like in those movies when they have like the girl and they give her like the makeover she gave herself the makeover really early and they didn't even like focus too much on that aspect it was kind of funny because she had this like unibrow and, and she got rid of the unibrow and I don't know it, it was about though him starting to go out on a date with this girl that was the kind of the dorky one as well. Um, I don't know. I thought it was pretty funny. Like I said, it has that kind of Napoleon Dynamite vibe. And it's kind of funny, too, how the girl that doesn't want to, you know, anything to do with him is kind of helping him, you know, try and get with this other girl. So it's kind of interesting that she doesn't really want to do with him, but then she's doing this. Um, a bunch of people, you know, character actors are in this as well. Jennifer Tilly plays one of the teachers in the movie. Uh, Jim Belushi's in the movie. This is just a fun, kind of quirky, kind of teen comedy. I, I, like I said, I had a fun time with it. Uh, the next one is a real conspiracy kind of movie. And it's Mirage Men. This is from Cinedime as well. This is a documentary which is basically about talk, saying that the government kind of covered up the whole idea that they came up with the idea of aliens and that basically they kind of put it in this guy's head who sort of spread it all around 
and really what they were doing was like experiments and weather experiments and certain kind of like government like sort of tests and things like that and they kind of put it in the head of this guy and it's pretty much about people like talking all about that and going into detail and personal accounts and things like that he was an interesting one um, like with me like I don't know what my take is on aliens and things like that you know like maybe there are maybe there aren't you know what I mean like I really don't know but it was an interesting take on the whole thing and kind of talking about you know how you know the government may might have been responsible for actually making people think there were aliens uh, the next one is from Sinaim as well and it's Steven Soderbergh presents Visitors and this movie is a total 100% art film which is really just shots of faces like close-up shots and it's all black and white of faces in slow motion and like animal faces of this gorilla and then shots of birds and then shots of buildings and with this really cool music over it but that's really what it is it's really just sort of a kind of a piece you just sort of look through seeing all these kind of aspects of of like life and things like that but it, it's it's definitely not something for everybody it was very interesting, though, like, I, but I can say, though, it, it's definitely not something that everyone's going to like. I, I like the music, but it's, um, it, it's hard to, it, 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 it's one of those, like, sort of movies where you kind of know what it's, you know what I'm talking about. You know, it's like that kind of, like, art sort of thing, which I don't have anything against, but I like some of the shots of the theme parks and things like that, but it's really hard to review something like that. Uh, the next one is um, Resurrection, the complete first season. And this show is not technically based on the French series, The Return, which I think is one of my all-time favorite series probably I've ever seen in my entire life, which I absolutely love the French show. Um, this is kind of a different take, which is more of a family kind of drama, a, like less dark vibe of that kind of show. This is about a kid who died 30 years ago and is like, coming back to life in the middle of um, you know this lake in another country and gets taken back to America to where his parents are. They're way older and it's kind of like the the guy who takes him over, Omar Epps' character, is trying to put together the pieces of how is this a kid and what is going on? Is this some kind of a miracle? And the parents, you know, the mom is really accepting him, but the father is having a hard time. And then it's also about other people start coming back, and it kind of is about the you know people dealing with it and everything like that. I enjoyed this. I believe it's been renewed for a second season, but I, I really like this a lot. I'm still in the midst of watching it, but I would definitely check this out, especially if you like the show The Return. Uh, the next one from um, Synapse. This is a documentary I was really interested in seeing, and it's a documentary on the video nasties, which are the films in the 80s that, that you know came out on video in the UK that were banned, you know, a number of movies. It was kind of about the whole group that was banning these films, and you know, kind of like the, the, you know, this, like basically they're basically trying to take these movies off the shelves and about like the bootlegging of these movies and the copies of things like Cannibal Holocaust that they saw in the town. And that's essentially what it is, is kind of going into detail about this time period and all the movies and the, kind of like what was banned. And then it has, a you know, discs of, um, you know, all the films that were banned and then the films that ended up coming out of banned. I think most of the films now are no longer banned. Or you can pretty much get them. You know, you could import the U.S. version. But back then, you know, you really couldn't do that. It was really, like, really hard to get these kind of movies. And you had to bootleg them. And it kind of talks about the people, about how they got them and things like that. I liked it. I thought it was a really cool companion piece to people who love documentaries on, you know, films and the 80s period and all those kind of films. Uh, the next one from um, Ark Entertainment is a fun animated film. It has Tim Curry in it, Ed Asner, Matthew Lillard, uh, George Takei, and it's Axel. It's about this, um, I don't exactly know what the things were. The whole movie is trying to figure out exactly what they were, but it's like these sort of kind of box-like kind of creatures that live in this land in the desert, and like kind of their whole food source is this cactus. And it's pretty much about him going on this kind of journey to try and get to this land of cactus to have more food for them. It's a fun uh, kids animated movie. I think kids would enjoy this a lot more. Um, I don't know. that. That's pretty much all I had to say on it. It was, like I said, though, I, I was kind of confused with what the thing was. I know, though, you're not really supposed to be thinking about what exactly the thing is, but I was, like, so fixated on the whole movie. What is this thing exactly? Uh, the next one from 
um, Arc Entertainment as well is Beyond the Trophy, which is an Eric Roberts, Michael Madison film. And this is basically about, you know, Tiny Lister is also in the movie as well. It's about these this one cop who's kind of like this cop who's starting to do, like, corrupt things and kind of trying to get back on the right path. But he's, you know, he's kind of dealing with these two kind of gangs that, you know, that are selling drugs and things like that. And he has, like, involvement with them. And he really wants to get out. But he knows that the only way he can get out is if he takes down the gang, you know, Michael Madison's character. And he pretty much, you know, plans to go undercover in these places to try and infiltrate one of the gangs to bring down the other one. So it's one of those kind of, like, infiltrating them, trying to bring them down. I thought it was an interesting movie. Um, you know, I, 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 pretty, I feel like I've been watching a lot of Eric Roberts movies lately, like Storage Lock, Locker and a bunch of different ones I've been watching lately. Always like Eric Roberts and Michael Madison and Ty Lister. But it's pretty much what it is. It's just, you know, one of those kind of gang undercover movies trying to bring them down. Uh, the next one is one that I've been interested in seeing for a long time, and it's Billy Zane, Lacey Chabert, Tra that's how you say that, and Daniel Harris, and it's The Ghost of Goodnight Lane, this is from Inception, and it's kind of a peculiar looking cover on it, because it looks sort of like a tree sort of thing, but it's about um, this kind of movie studio that's about to move location, and the movie studio was based, you know, like an editing facility, but they also have a set there, and a sound editing, all kinds of stuff, but it was built on the house of, well, actually, they're using the same house of where this girl died, and it's like the ghost is haunting the place, and the beginning of the movie I really liked the best, about the guy getting killed in the beginning, but it's basically about them at this at the studio, though, trying to finish up this movie that they made, and things are happening to them that night. People are starting to come back. I mean, people are starting to get possessed, and bad things are happening to people. They start dying. And there's some of these crazy stuff in here, like when Daniel Harris, and I'll show exactly how it was when she, like, one thing happens to her. She's like, <laughs> just like that. Exactly. But I, I had a fun time with it. And the last one I'll talk about is David Sterling's new film that he produced. Sorry if I'm hot, but I can't have the air on when I do this. And it's Camp Blood uh, First Slaughter, which uh, David Sterling talked about this in my shopping video. But it's, you know, Mark Polonia directed the film. And if you guys know Mark Polonia movies, I've been a fan of his stuff for years. And I really like this one. It's about these group of these students going out to the woods and investigate the story of Camp Blood. You know, of course, when they get out there, you know, the Camp Blood, you know, the guy, you know, the killer in the clown mask is after them. Well, he's actually wearing a different mask in this. Um, but I really had a fun time with this. And like I said, if you guys enjoy Mark Polonia movies and, you know, 80s style movies, I'll definitely check that out. So anyway, though, guys, thanks again for watching, for subscribing, and I'll see you guys later.